God. How great is our God. songwriter said he's bigger than any mountain that I may have to climb. I want you to know he's greater than any sickness that you may be facing tonight. He's greater than any trouble that you may be going through right now. The writer said great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Come on, I wish somebody would just give him praise right now. He is greatly to be praised. Hallelujah! Smile at somebody real big right now. Tell them you're happy to see them in the house of the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You can return to your seats. The ushers are coming. Get, going to give you an opportunity to return your tithe and offering unto the Lord. FPC 3. Don't forget your mystery dinner event Friday, 6.45 p.m. here at the church. If you haven't turned in your $10, please give that to the Elliots tonight if possible. Don't forget that this coming Friday night, 6.45 p.m. Amen. Are you ready for the word of the Lord tonight? I'm excited about what God's going to speak to us in this place. Lord, we love you and we're thankful. Thankful, God, because you've been so good to us. Anything that we have tonight, God, belongs to you. So tonight we come. Returning to you, God, a portion of what you blessed us with. Just to say thank you and to walk in obedience to your word tonight. Bless every gift and every giver. Bless every household that's faithful to you. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give unto the Lord tonight.
Hallelujah. Would you just lift your praise to the Lord tonight? What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord bless you. You may be seated tonight. Thank you for being faithful to the house of the Lord on this Wednesday night. And I'm so thankful that none of you melted on your way in in the rain tonight. I know the house is full of kindness and sugar and we didn't want you to melt. Praise God. I'm thankful for the body of Christ. and I'm thankful for the firm foundation upon which we stand tonight. That rock is Christ Jesus. And on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, today is a very special day in my family. Uh, 48 years ago today. Is that right? 48 years ago today. My mother and dad stood in the altar and said, I do. And I honor them today, Bishop. I honor you and my mother tonight. We thank the Lord for you. Love you. Don't we love our bishop? Amen. I'm just telling you tonight, 48 years is a long time to do somebody's laundry. You hear me? That's a long time. Praise God. Thankful that my mother and dad decided when I was just a baby that the kingdom would be first in our lives. And I'm so thankful for that. Amen? Amen. Tonight, I want to take your attention to the book of Matthew. And uh, I know I just had you be seated, but I'm going to ask you to stand in honor and respect to the word of the Lord. And while you're turning to the book of Matthew chapter Number six, I want to say how thankful we are tonight to have our guests that are here with us tonight. If you're a guest worshiping with us, we bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for being here. Also, church family, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your prayers in this season. As you know, it has been very busy, very taxing, a lot of moving and running and uh, preaching. My heart... Uh, my heart longs to be home when I'm gone, and there is no pulpit in the world that I would rather stand in than this one. I love being in the house of God with my church family. The, the season that we're in right now, um, several months ago, I had a prophet of the Lord call me. And he told me, he said, there's going to be a season that's coming that is going to make you uncomfortable. And he said, you're going to be gone just a little bit more than you're comfortable with. But he said, God is taking care of your church. It's his church. He said, God's sustaining your church. And the kingdom doors that are going to come open, he said, I, I want you to see it through a broad vision of what God is doing. And so I'm saying all of that to tell you tonight that even in my absence at times when I'm gone this church never suffers because we are so very blessed with the voices in this church thank God for Bishop thank the Lord for Pastor Jordan Fry and, and uh, my wife is uh, in Indianapolis at Music Fest tonight you know she graduated from Indiana Bible College and she was in the first praise, Indiana Bible College praise after Dr. Lyndall Anderson came to IBC, to Indianapolis, and this is his last uh, Indiana Bible College music fest, and so they are honoring him big, and Sister TJ is part of that, and so uh, I miss her tonight, but I'm telling you, Sister Morgan I don't know where she went, but thank you. Did a great job tonight. Thank you for leading us. Church family, we are blessed. We're blessed. God's been so good to us. Amen. What I'm going to preach to you tonight is, is nothing new. Um, 
I've told you sometimes I feel like a broken record. But there is so much power in this word that once you start trying to extrapolate principles and teachings in the word of God, it is absolutely amazing what God shows you in his word. How many of you believe if you're hungry, he'll feed you? Amen. So we're going to Matthew chapter 6, and for the sake of time tonight, I'm going to read you just one verse, and then we'll come back and and maybe kind of work our way through some expository stuff. We'll see what the Lord wants to do. I want Him to have His way tonight. We'll end up where He tells us to, but I want us to read the book of Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 10. If you're there, say amen. amen. Praise God. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Tonight, I don't have as much of a title for you as I do an exclamation, but I would like to Speak this exclamation, if I may, just a little above your heads tonight. And the title of what I'm going to preach to you this evening, I would like to exclaim this to the heavens. I want to tell the Lord for the First Pentecostal Church and for this city and this region tonight, we want your kingdom here. We want your kingdom here. Would you just extend your hands of faith? your hearts towards heaven. Father, we honor your name tonight. Thank you for your revealed name in the earth. For there is none other name underneath the heavens that has been given, that has been revealed among men whereby we must be saved. There is so much power in the name of Jesus. I believe tonight, Lord, that there is healing in your name. I believe that there is victory in your name. And I believe that in this house tonight, your name has been established. And tonight our prayer, Lord, is that you would begin to establish your kingdom where your name is established. That your hand would be on this house, that you would minister to every heart, to every life. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And let the church say amen. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Thank you, Lord. If you will just spend some time with me tonight, I want to to see if we can't some way, somehow, dig just a little bit deeper than we have dug before. I don't want to get stuck here tonight by any measure, but... uh, I want to tell you that uh, there are some sacred things that have been revealed for God's people that have seemingly been hijacked by other people that do not belong to Him. Now, I know that everyone was born and created in the image of God. I understand that. But not everyone walks in relationship with God. And there is an absolute difference it's not just like implicit it's completely explicit in the scripture that there are some things that God has reserved for a remnant of people I'll give you some examples tonight for instance you can help me with this the name of the Lord is a strong tower the who the righteous run into it And they're safe. There's safety there. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. But not just anybody runs into it. It's a place that is reserved for the righteous. Now I know the world has hijacked some things. They love at football games and basketball games and all of these public places, whether it's New York City, when they're doing the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, you'll see people hold up banners, John 3.16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, I want to tell you, there's a lot more to this thing than just saying, I believe. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that you're one of the ones that believeth on him just because you say, I believe on him. There's more to this than believing on him. And if I had time, I would walk you down the road completely. But there's precedent set and established even so in the book of Acts, the 19th chapter, when they asked John's disciples, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? I do feel sometimes that I wish it were a little bit easier. I wish that there was some way that you could just look at somebody and say, yeah, go ahead and believe on him. But James makes something very clear about that, that just believing on him is absolutely not enough for even the devils believe that there is one God. James said, if you believe in one God, you've done well. Because even the devils believe. Now, I know this is probably too simple for some people, but I want to tell you, you can't argue with the book and you can't argue with the precedent. I'm telling you, if believing was enough, James said that the devils themselves believe in him. There is more to this than just believing on him. But modern religion has created a culture that is defined not by who he is, but rather by what we want him to be. God's power, although infinite and beyond understanding, has been so limited in modern day Christendom because we have made him in the image of man rather than the understanding that man was created in the image of God. It is a fact that the gods of this world have been formed by the ideas and the concepts of man. We look at all the idols of this world. We look at all the idolatry of this world. And it looks a little different today than it did for Abraham and his father. It looks a little different for us in this day than it did in Bible times. But I want to tell you that the spirit of idolatry is still as prevalent even more so today than it has ever been. But there is a principle that I want to tell you, I believe with all my heart, and I'll probably get some shots taken at me for this, but please understand, my motive and my spirit are pure. But I want to tell you that modern day Christendom has in and of itself become idolatry. People have absolutely made a mockery of God. I just happened to tune in recently to a church not far from here, of which the pastor was teaching on uh, inviting Jesus to your table or something like that, and to set the precedent for the series that they were doing. They brought a table out, set it up on the platform, and brought a big bottle of wine out and some wine glasses. And the opening statement of that pastor was, I noticed all of your eyes lit up when you saw wine on the platform. As in like, it makes you happy. And began to talk about how happy it makes people in the church to drink wine together. Now, look. We live in a kingdom of deliverance. Not a kingdom of relief, saints. And I'm going to tell you tonight, I'll believe it till the day that I die. If you have been delivered by the, from the spirit of alcohol, by the spirit of the Lord, there should be no place in your life for social drinking. But we have, we have literally formed God in our image. We have made church what we want it to be. We have made, and when I say we, I'm talking about so-called Christendom as a whole, especially in North America, it has become, in a lot of ways, glorified disco halls and parties and incredible people shaking their hips, gyrating. Literally, it's, it's out there for people to see it. I'm not trying to be negative. I promise I'm going somewhere good, but literally things that Elvis Presley got 
booed off of stages for because they said he was too vulgar. It's now we're free to do it in churches in America. Shaking hips, grabbing private parts, acting insane and saying, don't we love being with Jesus today? I'm going to tell you that Jesus, when his disciples asked him how to pray, he got into some concepts that are deeper than what have been hijacked by modern Christendom. There has been, in my opinion, a mockery made of Matthew chapter 6. Because this has just become a prayer that is repeated over and over and over. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But nobody means what they're saying. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, I want to tell you tonight. If you're willing to open up your mouth and pray prayers like thy kingdom come. What you're really insinuating is that if his kingdom comes, your kingdom goes. We have been taught to love God. Even as a nation, you can't see much presence of it right now in this nation. But even as a nation in its early beginnings, we were taught to love God. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. But I want to tell you, those days, they seem like they're a long ways from us right now. And I want to tell you why it's doing that. We can look at the world and blame the world all we want to. And I know this is a strong beginning, but I'm taking you somewhere tonight. I want to say to you that the world is not the problem. What do you mean, Pastor? I'm saying the world has always been the world. The world was worldly before there was ever a church. The world was dark before there was ever a church. Before the church ever began, in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God separated light from darkness, which lets us know that there was darkness in the beginning. There has always been darkness. But when Abram began to pray to the Lord about his nephew Lot and his family that were stuck in Sodom, the Lord did not just blame the wickedness of Sodom. As a matter of fact, he said, if I could just find ten righteous people in Sodom that would be righteous, I would save the city. I say to you tonight that Sodom was not destroyed because the people were so wicked. Sodom was destroyed because the righteous refused to be righteous. The church has always been taught to love God. But I want to tell you what we haven't taught and what modern religion has become. And I feel like I want to, I want to preach this and teach this until it becomes a part of the fabric, the fiber, the makeup of who you are. I want it to be the cadence and the rhythm that you step to. It is not enough to just love God. You must learn to despise iniquity. You've got to fall in love with God, but you've got to reject the iniquity of this world. You've got to learn to fall in love with the Word of God. And you've got to learn to reject everything that's contrary to the Word of God. That doesn't mean that you hate people. That doesn't mean that you despise people. It means you despise the iniquity of this world. I'm preaching to you tonight under the anointing of the Holy Ghost that the world has always been worldly. But it's time for the church to be godly. There's something in the scripture that you don't ever hear talked about on Christian radio and you don't ever hear it talked about on TBN. But this little phrase scares me to death. If the righteous scarcely be saved. If the righteous. I want that to settle in on you tonight. How many of you want to be righteous? God, I want it more than anything. I want to be righteous, but I want it to be clear to you. You can't be, nobody can be good enough 
to make it in by miles. He said it's scarcely, it's a march, small, very small margin. Even the people that want to please God, it's going to be very marginal, very close to how they come in. Well, there's no real precedent for that. There's absolutely a precedent for that. And Jesus said it. He said, broad is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way. That leads to life everlasting. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, we've still got to believe it, and we've still got to preach it, and we've still got to embrace it. We are on a narrow path, but the spirit of the age has crept into the church and said, you've got to broaden this thing a little bit. You're going to have to broaden the path a little bit. If you want to be relevant and you want to reach the world, you've got to broaden the way. The Bible never teaches us to broaden the way. It teaches us to narrow our focus. It teaches, oh God, it teaches us to take our focus and bring it together. It's not just enough to love God. We must despise iniquity. You got to despise it. You got to despise it. If you take a look at the life of Demas, Demas was as faithful as any companion that the Apostle Paul ever had. As a matter of fact, Paul talks about him being right there in the prison cell with him. And I don't have time to rightly divide all of this, but it's very interesting to me that a man who was willing to go to prison with Paul just a few chapters later, Paul said to Timothy, he said, bring me my cloak, bring me my books. He said, just just bring me my parchment. Bring it all to me. He said, because Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Can I, can I interject something here tonight as respectfully as I can? I do not believe that Demas hated God. If he hated God, he wouldn't have been in prison with Paul. The problem was not that he did not love God. The problem was that he also loved the world. But love has been defined by the world, not by the word. And so love has become a feeling. Woo-wee. It's a little tough right here right now. And, and, and so this concept of love has been based on the false reality that we have made of what love should feel like and that love should always be great. And so that's how people fall out of love. You can be seated. <laughs> love, love is not a feeling. Love, love is absolutely, it's a verb. I was just talking to someone this week. I don't remember, I don't remember who I was talking to, but I was talking to them about the old Covey book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It was talking about this man who, who, who said, I don't love my wife anymore. After whatever, I can't remember, it's been years since I read the book, but the, the principle was, he said, I've fallen out of love with my wife. I don't love her anymore. And his response to him was, okay, then go love her. He said, no, I don't think you understand. I just told you, I don't love my wife anymore. He said, okay, go love her. Boy, it's quiet up in here. Did you hear that? You can hear a rat licking ice in here right now. I don't, I don't love her. Well, then go love her. I just, I've fallen out of love with the church. Well, go love it. I've fall, I fallen out of love with holiness. I, I just don't think it's necessary. You know, it, the problem is that it's, it's become unnecessary to you. It's always been necessary to God. The problem is that it becomes unnecessary to us. And the reason it's become unnecessary is because we've fallen out of love with it. And I'm taking you somewhere tonight. But, but, but I, I, I don't want this to get messed up at all. Holiness has become something that is demanded from certain positions towards certain people. That if you're not holy, then you don't love him. So you prove your love by keeping commandments. That is not what Jesus taught. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He did not say, you'll prove your love for me because you're keeping commandments. The whole point about this conversation was not the commandment. The point was the love. 
If you got somebody that falls in love with this thing, commandments are never a problem. I know we love Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, and we talk about it being, man, it is, it is the cornerstone of, of one God, but, but that's really not true. Actually, Genesis 1-1 is our cornerstone. Deuteronomy 6 and 4, there has already been revelation given, and in context, I want, them, I want to make this clear to you. He said, hear, O Israel, the Lord, somebody tell me that next part. How can he be our God if we don't know who he is? God is not revealing himself to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. They already know who he is, but this is a commandment. This is not revelation. This is commandment. He said, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. The principle about this is not the revelation of who he is, but if you can get the revelation of who he is, then you can love him with everything you've got. And the evidence that you know who he is is that you love him with everything that you've got. It's a cycle that we've got to understand tonight. I could never prove my love to him by keeping his commandments. But if I love him, his commandments will be such a part of who I am. (laughs) Holiness can never be demanded. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take a step out here tonight. And I'm going to preach something that I'll stand on till the coming of Jesus or till he takes me out. I want to say something to you tonight. Demanded holiness is not holiness. It's not real. If the holiness in your life is to please a preacher, you've missed it. Look, I don't have any commandments. Do you hear me, sweet people? I, I'm just being honest with you. I don't, I don't have any commandments. Now, there's certain things that, that we don't do, and there's certain places that we don't go. Yeah, that's all true. Our platform is at, there's things that we just, we don't do it. But here's what you could tell. It's so, it's so funny. When somebody steps out from under the weight of ministry, then they start doing what they want to do. You can tell they never did it because they loved God. They did it because they wanted to make man happy. And I want to tell you that I have to be the same man on vacation that I am in this pulpit. I have to be the same man in my house when there's nobody but just me and my family. I've got to be the same man in my house that I am in this pulpit. And I, oh, God, help me right now. I want to be very careful tonight. I'm not taking shots, but I want you to understand this preacher tonight. I love you. I thank God for you. I would literally lay down my life for the people of this church. But you will not make it to heaven by trying to please me. It's not going to happen. I am not your judge. I am the man that God has placed in this city, in this pulpit, to preach to you the words of life. But they are not life to you if they are not received. I'm reaching for you to let you understand tonight. This has never been about my kingdom. This has never been about Bishop's kingdom. This has never been about Brother Bingham's kingdom. I want his kingdom here. Yes, it's a fact that my family has pastored in the same church since 1966, but this is not my kingdom, and this is not my church, and you are not my people. I am not the Pharaoh that stands up here and tells you where you can and cannot go. You know what I want to do? I want to preach God so real that you fall in love with everything about him, and that holiness that we preach across this pulpit isn't hard to grab, not because you love your pastor, and I'm so glad that you do, but I want you to fall in love with his kingdom. Because if I can get you to love his kingdom, everything else takes care of itself. When you love his kingdom, you're better at work. When you love his kingdom, you're a better spouse. 
When you love his kingdom, you're a better Sunday school teacher. Come on. When, you're, when you love his kingdom, you are absolutely a better parent. And I want to tell you parents tonight, we got to take the weight on our shoulders and quit expecting our kids to bring the kingdom. we got to fall in love with this thing. Men, I want to tell you the weight is on you. Don't make your wife lead your family in prayer. Don't make your wife be the one that leads your family in the direction of the church. God, give us men that will fall in love with the kingdom. I want his kingdom. And I want it here. (laughs) It's a prayer in my life on a consistent basis. God, I want you to be glorified. I want you to be glorified in my life. I want you to be glorified in my family. I want you to be glorified in my children. I want you to be glorified in my marriage. I want you to be glorified in this church. I want you to be glorified in this city. Ladies and gentlemen, the problem gets revealed in people's lives. And please don't think that I'm trying to be ugly tonight. But I've told you for years, I've been here full time, January 24 years, that I've been on the pastoral staff of this church. And I've told you all my life that I do not want this church being built on just my personality. I want to love people, and I want to have a good personality. I want to have a relationship with you people that's beyond just spiritual things. I want to be a friend. I want to be kind. But before God ever called me to be a friend to you, he called me to be a shepherd to you. But I've got to stay submitted to him. I've got to stay submitted to the calling. I've got to stay submitted to what he has desired of me to be. And, 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 and I want you to know tonight, I want you to know tonight from the bottom of my heart that I don't, I don't want this thing ever. I don't ever want, want, I know what people say and I know what they mean. I, I'm, I'm not saying this in any way to, uh, uh, to chide or, 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 or to hurt anybody because it's just part of what we do. But when, when people say they go to Brother St. Clair's church or they go to Brother Carson's church, or they whatever. They, I, I understand what they're saying because that man is the shepherd. But please hear your pastor tonight. This is not my church. This is not my church. I didn't die for this church. You hear me? I didn't die for this church. We are not our own. We've been bought with a price. He purchased this church right here, 630 West 53rd Street. He purchased this church, but he didn't just purchase this church. He purchased the church, and this assembly is part of the church. But you got to understand that anything that hasn't fallen in love with his kingdom is not a part of the church. Man, I feel like I'm digging a little deep tonight. (laughs) Thank God for people that honor and respect and love. I'm so grateful. So grateful for it tonight. But some, some time ago, I got so smitten in my heart. There was a man that had come to this church. Did so good, spent months in Bible study. And uh, he left the Lord, left the church. I'm, when I say left the Lord, I'm not saying that in a judgmental way. I'm telling you, he, it was go big or go home, and he went big and went home. And uh, it was a tough deal. Somebody asked me, said, well, what did you do, fall out of love with God? And he said, no. He said, I just fell in love with pastor. No, no, I don't mean that in a sexual way. You understand what I'm saying? I don't, please, don't, I'm not casting anything. He said, I just, I fell in love with pastor. Well, that smoked me. Somebody could fall in love with the relationship. Let me tell you what this reveals. It's what I call Lot syndrome. Lot had a great relationship with Abraham, so much so that he was like his own son. But when God removed Abraham from Lot, Lot fell in love with Sodom. 
Because he had a relationship with the man. And the man had a relationship with God. I don't want to raise a church. God help me tonight. I don't want to raise a church in Anderson. That you're counting on me to get you to heaven. I want to raise a kind of church in this city. That falls so in love with his kingdom. Oh God help me. I pray to God that if he don't return, I pray I live to be 150 years old and I'm the healthiest 150 year old you've ever seen. You'll never meet him, but he loves life any more than I do. I'm telling you, I love life. I love everything about living. I love the fun things in life. God have mercy. I love my family. I love preaching. I love traveling. I love flying airplanes. I dream about that more than I dream about anything. But you know what? I've seen people fall into this, into this paradoxical moment where they thought they were sealed with his kingdom until God moved the man. And when the man went missing, so did their love. There's beauty in Everything that we do, my granddad used to say all the time, he said, every asset has a liability. And uh, it is an asset for me to pastor in the same city that I was raised and follow after two of the greatest men I've ever known in this pulpit. But I want to tell you what I've also seen, I've lived through two transitions. And I've seen a lot of people who built their relationship on men. Oof. I hope you don't think this is easy preaching for me tonight. I got a word in my spirit. I want his kingdom here. I want his kingdom here. That word kingdom in the Greek language, is, it's a really neat word. Because it literally means his royalty, his established dominion. I want you to think about that. If you were to synonymously and, and not take into error in any way, add to, take away from the scripture, you could do this by interchanging this word when he said, thy kingdom come. You could literally say this by, by, by praying it like this. I want your established dominion to come. The, the kingdom that you established, the royalty of who he is. I want your kingdom, your dominion that you've established to come here. And your will to be done here. In earth as it is in heaven. And you can look at this. Now, I, I wish I could really jump out here into deep end. Y'all take your floaties off right now. You know what earth means in this? Where we're living. You know what heaven means as it is in heaven? Where he's living. There's not any, like, there, there's no really cool revelation in here. It, it's the separation. This is earth where we are, and this is his kingdom in heaven where he's established it. This is what he said. As I've judged on it in heaven, I want you to pray for it to come in the earth. Now, you tell me tonight, precious saints of God, where there's any ambiguity in this. That God's people will always be people that value his kingdom more than their own. There's zero ambiguity in the scripture. He said, I want you to pray, our Father which art in heaven. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Aren't you glad you're not the one that's in heaven? In several ways. I'm thankful you're still with us and I'm really thankful that some of you aren't sitting on the throne tonight. Y'all better be glad I'm not God. When my dad was pastoring this church, there was a little boy in this, in this church that thought my dad was Jesus. And when he'd come walking in, he'd say, here comes Jesus. And I'm like, well, Jesus beat the hawk out of me, just so you know. <laughs> he said, here comes Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you. My daddy's as great a man as I've ever met in my life. And he is very much Christ-like. But he is not Jesus. 
There's not a person in this room tonight that sits on the throne of judgment. Not one. And that is the most powerful opening to this prayer. I know we just read it quickly. But I want to tell you, this opening of this prayer is unbelievable. This is about praise. This is about exaltation. This is adoration, 100%. I'll walk down that road with you. But I'm going to tell you what it is factually. It is recognition of where he sits and where I sit. Our Father, where's he at? In heaven. He's there. I'm here. He sees things differently than I do. The Lord saw the things that the 21st century church would be facing today then. And he believed enough in you that you could live for him and make it in the most godless society. That's why the book of Acts said, save yourselves from this untoward. It's not toward God. But if the church started and was productive and bore fruit in an untoward generation, then we can have revival and we can bear fruit and we can have his kingdom in an untoward generation. I promise you. I promise you that the Supreme Court cannot stop revival in God's church. I promise you that before there was ever a Supreme Court, there was a Supreme Justice. What? You are not just a part of creation. You are not just a small part of a bigger picture. You were literally created by the hand of God. And when a terrible decision made by mankind separated us from the presence of God, God robed himself in flesh to come fix the problem that we created. So don't tell me that he's just this mean, horrible figure that sits on that throne in heaven sending people to hell. Absolutely not. He came from his throne in glory. I love that song, Down From His Glory. The great creator became bishop, my savior. He became my savior. While we were yet sinners, you believe that? He died. This means that when he came, he came to purchase back what we had sold. Because you are that valuable to him. Why are you saying this, Pastor? Because I want you, as the church of the living God, at First Pentecostal Church tonight, I'm not preaching to anybody else. If they're watching online, let them watch. I'm preaching to you people in this room right now. I want you to know who you are by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I want you to start believing in you the way that the enemy believes in you. That's why the enemy never wants you to find out who you truly are. Because if you ever realize who you are in Christ, the enemy knows I'll never stand a chance. If they ever realize who they are, they'll never believe another lie that I tell them. They will never be dissuaded by me again. They will never be distracted by me again. We've got to understand that our redemption from sin, this is a tough lesson, but our redemption from sin was not the only reason he came. Ooh, that's kind of tough. It's true. He did not just come to redeem us. He said, I came to establish my kingdom. And he said, I came to establish my kingdom in you. Don't you understand what I'm saying? This is not just a one-stop shop, get saved and everything's fixed. Absolutely not. I believe with every fiber of my being, you must repent of your sins, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is the plan of salvation for the rest of my life. I've got to stay saved, working daily for him. Let me tell you, 
if Jesus just wanted to come give people a high five and say, I'm thankful you believe in me, why in the world did he get these people to follow him for three and a half years? And then why in the world did he tell them, you go pour into other people and greater works than these works that I've done shall you do? This messes with people. I'm telling you, it messes with people. But I'm afraid sometimes we want to rob the things from the Scripture, manipulate them and make them what we want them. You've probably heard me, most of you have heard me teach this in the past. But in the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, this keeps me on my face. We love this. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost comes on you. You shall be witnesses unto me. Back in the day, I used to preach, you don't have any choice. You got a witness. You got, you got to go be a witness because you got the power to be a witness. You got to go witness to somebody. You know that word witness right there doesn't mean go tell somebody? You know what that word is in the Greek? That word witness, it's martus. M-A-R-T-U-S, martus. Or as we would say kind of in our English language, martus. It's where we get the word martyr. Hope you got your seatbelts on. Because he said, the power that I'm giving you is not just powerful enough to teach you to live. Woo-wee. Church family, I'm, I'm, I'm being slow for a reason right here. I don't want to spit this to the fifth row and lose y'all. But we got some serious problems in the church when we're still trying to figure out how much living we actually have to do to still be saved. I just don't really see that as necessary for holiness. I, I think you guys have misconstrued what holiness is, and we start trying to explain away everything. I don't think that's necessary anymore. I don't think God cares about that stuff anymore. Listen, you're still trying to figure out how to live. And he said the Holy Ghost is going to give you enough power that you can die. He said, I'm giving you enough Holy Ghost power that you can go and be martyrs for me beginning at Jerusalem. If all this was about was just touching Jesus, watching his miracles, you tell me, please tell me, out of, out of the first 12 apostles that Jesus named, only one of them took his own life and the other 11 were martyred for the kingdom's sake. And we're still trying to figure out how much church is too much, really. I mean... Oh, boy, this is tight. I don't know. I just, I, I just don't think it's necessary to go three times a week. You know what? Am I, just the way I'm wired, if it was open seven days a week, I'd be here. If I wasn't a pastor, I'd be here. Because I love his kingdom that much. I want his kingdom to come. But you can, you can tell the people who love their kingdom. I hope you all know my heart tonight. I'm not, I promise you I'm not here to be ugly. But you can tell people that love their kingdom because that's what they build the most. And you can tell people that love his kingdom because that's what they build the most. It's not a secret. And I'm not, I'm not teaching you anything Jesus didn't teach you. He said, where your treasure is. Hear me, church family. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He said, you'll never have to ask a man where his heart is. Just look at where his treasure is. I want his kingdom. I want it here. I want his kingdom in my life. I want his kingdom in my spirit. I want his kingdom on my flesh. That's a tough one right there, isn't it? I want his kingdom. When you pray, pray after this manner. Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven. There's so much more that we can unpack here tonight. I'm almost finished. It's a little different feeling in here on this Wednesday night. Because I'm teaching to you about where we live. If I may be so bold to declare it to you tonight. You may be slick enough to pull the wool over a preacher's eyes. You may be slick enough to pull the wool over my eyes because I'm not a very smart man. 
I'm going to tell you, there's nothing hidden from his spirit. And all things are going to be revealed in time. Including what we love the most. Time has a way of revealing. Because when his kingdom has come in your life, when the going gets tough, you just keep on going. But when you love the things of this world more than you love the things of God, when your life gets tough, you just start packing up your bags and saying, well, I guess he didn't want me to be better or he would have delivered me out of it. I wonder what would have happened, the story would have changed with the three Hebrew boys if they had said, if God loved us and he wouldn't make us go in this fire. I wonder what would have happened with Daniel if he said, well, if the Lord loved me, I'd never had to go into this lion's den. That's hogwash. That, that is absolutely prosperity preaching. You, you, can't, you can't find anywhere in the scripture that the will of God is to just deliver us out of everything that happens to pick us up. Oh, I'm, I know many are the afflictions of the righteous and the Lord delivers out of them all. The context of that is not that he picks me up out of the trouble and moves me. He delivers us out of them all. We walk, yea, though I walk through. Are y'all with me? But the people that have proven their love for him never argued with him about how much it was going to cost to live for him. They always laid it out and said, whatever it costs me, I'd be willing to die for him. In closing tonight, I want to tell you that in my heart, you know where I'm at on this. I'd be a terrible dad, terrible pastor, terrible husband. If I didn't want to pray for a, for a pre-trib rapture. Jesus said, pray you be counted worthy. Just check these things. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not getting into eschatology. I'm just saying, in my heart, I do pray. I do pray for a pre-trib rapture. I tell the Lord all the time, I hope you'll, hope you'll deliver us. But I'm going to tell you something. While people are standing around fighting on what, over whether it's pre, mid, or post, I'm going to tell you what's happening in the midst of our arguing on what life's going to be like in that process is people are forgetting how to die. Because they, they think they've got it all figured out. I'm going to see this, 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 and this happen. I'm going to see this on the Temple Mount. I'm going to see that with the man of sin. I'm gonna see, and they think they got it all figured out. But in the process of that, there's something we forget. Not one of us know when we're going to breathe our last breath. No. None of us. Now, I'm going to tell you, I hope he comes. The more I study, the more I read, I feel like we're probably going to have to endure some stuff. But I hope you know from the heart of your pastor tonight what I've come to appeal to you in my spirit and in my heart. And I hope you know that my heart is as pure as it's ever been and my motive is right when I preach this to you. But I want to tell you, if we, if we do, if this post-trib concept, post-trib, pre-wrap, whatever. I'm not staking my claim on tonight and saying, if you disagree with me, you're going to hell. I'm saying, if we have to endure some tribulation, hearts will be revealed. We will know whose kingdom came and whose kingdom stayed and whose kingdom went. We will probably never see a time that it's as easy to live for God as it is right now ever again. I hope I didn't just discourage you. Y'all know I love you tonight. I'm telling you as your pastor, if you're waiting on the season that it's going to get easier for us to do this, please buy in today. Right. Amen. I, 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 I'm trying my best to not bore you to death. I don't want you snoring in Greek and dreaming in Hebrew on me tonight. But I'm here to make an appeal publicly before God's people tonight. This world feels different to me right now than it's ever felt. And it's not just me. Y'all hear me? Oh God, there's something on me tonight. This whole world feels different. I've never seen the Antichrist system with the, with the traction that it's got right now. Ever. And I watched this last week. Please don't think I'm being critical. But I watched this last week. People said, oh, this, this, here comes the eclipse. This is the rapture. Right. This is the eclipse. Oh, 
this has got to be the day. My God, what's wrong with us? Oh, God. What is wrong with us? That we're trying so hard to convince people that eclipse days are at. Well, which time zone is it going to be in? I, I happen to be in Dallas at full eclipse, but I got it before y'all got it. I saw full eclipse before you did. So which time zone is he going to pick? Does he love Dallas people more than he, more than he loves Indiana people? I mean, which point this is going to happen? And we're, we're trying to look smart, and we're trying to figure it all out. And the Spirit's saying, come to me. Come. Lay it all down. Reckless abandon. Leave your net slain there. Let the dead bear the dead. We think that's cold. We think, oh, the Jesus, he was, just, he was just hard on those guys. No, he wasn't. He was teaching them something. I want you to give it everything you got. If you're going to come after me, I want you to give it everything you've got. I want my kingdom in your life. Church family, I, I'm, I'm done. But I'm going to tell you, if you're still trying to figure out what kind of standards are necessary and unnecessary and how holy do I really have to be to still be apostolic? And what am I, what am I going to have to Listen, I'm going to tell you. You're not going to make it. I stand here assuredly and tell you, you're not going to make it. Because when you're looking for loopholes right now, it shows the weakness of the world that has battered your mind. You know, people say, Nobody wants this apostolic way because we're too holy. We're too separate. Too many, too many rules. Have you looked at anything lately on how fast some sects of the Muslim religion are growing? I'm talking about covered from the tips of their noses all the way down to the floor. And we say, please don't wear clothes that show from Dan to Beersheba, please. Please keep them slits down there. We don't need that. We don't need to see what God reserved for your husband. Just hide all that. Put those away. Like, let's be, let's just be holy. Men, be separated. When you go play ball, be different than everybody else on the court. Just be holy. There's distinction. There's separation. Let's, let's just be different. Well, I, well, I don't know. I don't have chapter line and verse four. So I, listen, that scares me to death. I want his kingdom to come here. His kingdom in my life. I want you to stand with me tonight. It's been quiet in here. I hope it's because you're listening tonight. On earth, in earth, as it is in heaven, God, if you require everything of me, then everything is what I must give. But God, I believe according to your word. That your desire for me is more than what's commanded of me. For you said of servants that have done all that has been commanded of them. That when you've done everything that's been commanded. That you are then an unprofitable servant. I pray for these precious people under the sound of my voice tonight God. Every man, every woman, every child, every young man, every young woman. That's struggling with who they are trying to find identity. Lord our identity is in you and you alone. It's in you that I live and move and have my being. I'm not here tonight, God, trying to find out how much I can live without. The only thing I know is I can't live without you. I can't live without your kingdom. I can't live without your presence. I can't live without your church. I can't live without your body. I can't live without a preacher in my life. How can they be saved without a preacher? i got to have a man of God in my life. It's a fact. But, Lord, I want you to know, whatever you ask of me, I will not withhold I will give you all. I will give you all. If all is what you ask of me, I will not withhold. And if my sacrifice is less, Then giving you my very best, help me remember Calvary's cost and be willing to say yes. Anybody want to tell him yes tonight? I will give you all, 
Lord, I will give you all. If all is what you ask of me, I will not withhold. Think about it. And if my sacrifice is less than giving you my very best, let me remember Calvary's cross and be willing. Can we stretch our faith towards him one more time tonight? God, I preach what you put on my heart. Lord, I believe these precious people love you. But I'm asking you to search our hearts tonight, Lord. If there's anything in me that keeps me from loving all of you and everything about your kingdom, I'm asking you to reveal it in my life tonight. I will give you all. I will give you all. If all is what you ask of me, I will not withhold. Could you sing it, church? And if my sacrifice is less than giving you my very best help me remember Calvary's cost and be willing if there's anything I want to be guilty of as your pastor it's making you fall so in love with Jesus that nothing anybody could ever say or do in your life would make you love him less I want you to love him so much that whatever he asks of you would not withhold. I want you to look at somebody close to you tonight and tell them, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. Help me remember Calvary's cross. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of thanks tonight? Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for your precious church that you purchased with your own blood. Thank you for these amazing saints that have gathered in the house of the Lord tonight. I pray in Jesus' name that you would strengthen the body. But above all else, God, let us fall in love with you. Let all the kings and kingdoms of this earth pass away. But let us love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Keep us in your grip till we gather back together in the house of the Lord. We'll give you all the thanks, the praise, and the glory. In Jesus' name, let the church.